안녕하십니까? 허인식 원장입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. Hoinshik. There's going to be four master course lectures offline on the same topic, but I'm going to abbreviate it and summarize it and deliver it to you. Today, the first topic is overview on peri-implant soft tissue. There are four major topics today. First is a basic understanding on the peri-implant tissue. Second, the difference between periodontal tissue and peri-implant tissue. Third, inflammatory response in peri-implant tissue. And fourth, how to make a healthy peri-implant tissue. First is understanding peri-implant tissue. The periodontal tissue of natural tooth consists of bone, tooth, and in between there is cementum, connective tissue, junctional epithelium, and such. Alveolar bone, PDL, and tooth are major components. In frontal view, there is interdental gingiva, and the attached gingiva that is attached strongly to bone. There's alveolar mucosa, which is mobile, and in between there's mucogingival junction. What differences are there in peri-implanted tissue? First, between implant and alveolar bone, there's no PDL. And the fibers that consist of connective tissue and its surroundings differ slightly. The most important concept is biologic width of natural tooth. In 1961, a scholar called Cargillo introduced the concept of uh, biologic width. This distance combining junctional epithelium and connective tissue is very important. On average, the distance is 2.73 millimeters. This area is referred to as biologic width. Around the implant, as is with natural tooth, there is biologic width. Why does it exist? Biologic width serves a very important role for tooth and implant function, and this is a structure that inevitably needs to exist. Sulcus steps, connective tissue, and junctional epithelial tissues combined some may differ slightly. According to research, epithelium connective tissue the width should be wider. There are many researches on biologic width of implant, and on the left is related to natural tooth, and the left is about the implant. The biologic width of natural tooth is about 2.2 millimeters on average, and in the case of implant, it is 1 millimeter more. That is the current report. Over the course of our lives, biological width is maintained consistently. The detailed constituents of biologic width continue to dynamically change. For instance, the sulcus steps decreases with age, and on the other hand, in the case of junctional epithelium, with age it increases. In the case of connective tissue attachment, which is most important, with age de decreases. Overall, about 3 mm of biologic width is continuously maintained. What does this mean? When we place implant, if implant placement depth is really shallow, 
In other words, if gingiva thickness is very thin and is below 2 mm so due to long fully dentulous period, if you place the implant on alveolar crest level, because the width of soft tissue for biologic width is insufficient, biologically the bone is resorbed to maintain the biologic width. That is the natural response our body shows. Second, what is different between natural periodontal tissue and peri-implant tissue? The biggest difference between natural tooth and dental implant is fiber arrangement. In the case of natural tooth, vertically, horizontally, and transversally, the fiber are entangled with each other. However, in the case of implant, the fiber arrangement is very simple. Let's think of a net. In the case of tightly knit net, there is very little possibility of fish getting away, but if the net is loosely knit, then all the small fish will get away. It's the same principle because the fiber arrangement is very loosely knit around the implant. It is more susceptible to bacteria and different diseases. Blood supply around natural tooth comes from various places such as periosteum, periodontal ligament, and connective tissue. Therefore, sufficient blood supply is available. However, around the implant, it is quite limited. The blood supply primarily comes from periosteum. Comparatively, therefore, it is insufficient. Reduced blood supply means reduced healing capacity. Third, inflammatory response of peri-implant tissue. Around natural tooth and around the implant, there is biological width. The most important role of biologic width is to provide protection from exterior sources like bacteria. It protects from bacteria and foreign debris. It protects the bone from it. When compared with natural tooth around the implant, there is less blood flow. Therefore, it's quite unfavorable in terms of immune response against the bacteria. So when we probe natural tooth and implant, you need to bear in mind that in the case of natural tooth, because it has a very strong attachment, you cannot put in probe beyond a certain extent. But in the case of implant, the fiber is loosely knit. Therefore, if you apply excessive force when doing probing, you can reach the bone. Hence, the accuracy of probing can go down in the case of implant compared with natural tooth. When we probe around the implant with inflammation, if you apply excessive force, then probing up to the alveolar bone can occur and it can cause bleeding, so we need to pay attention. Peri-implant disease can be divided into peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. The prevalence of peri-implanted disease is higher than we think according to research. In the case of peri-implant mucositis, it occurs in about 80% of patients and 50% of implants placed, so one out of two people experience this disease. According to this research, peri-implant mucositis occurs in over 90% of implants placed and peri-implantitis occurs in 28% of the patients and 12% of the implants placed. In other words, peri-implanted disease prevalence is much higher than we think, so we need to pay attention. 
The biggest difference between periodontal disease and peri-implant disease is that in the case of periodontal disease, there's always healthy connective tissue between alveolar bone and inflammation, and it protects the bone. In the case of peri-implanted disease, the healthy connective tissue in between alveolar bone and inflammation does not exist. Once a peri-implantitis occurs, it progresses much faster and the severity of it will be worse. Then how can we make healthy peri-implanted tissue? Making healthy peri-implant tissue first, sufficient biologic width needs to be secured. This is very important. Based on my experience, I've divided peri-implant mucosa into four different types. First is attached to keratinized tissue, second non-attached to keratinized tissue, third attached to non-keratinized tissue, and fourth non-attached to non-keratinized mucosa. In other words, this. In the case of attached to keratinized mucosa, it is keratinized mucosa with biologic width. Second, non-attached to keratinized mucosa, it is keratinized mucosa without biologic width. Third, attached to non-keratinized mucosa. Biologic width is secured, but it is non-keratinized mucosa. Fourth, non-attached non-keratinized mucosa. This is non-keratinized mucosa without the biologic width. Please remember these four different types. If you bear this in mind, you will be able to have successful implant treatment and the prognosis will be good. First, attached to keratinized mucosa. This is keratinized mucosa with biologic width. It's an example. As you can see, around the implant there is sufficient keratinized mucosa. Yes, FGG or free gingival graft has been performed. The thickness of peri-implant mucosa or abutment height is sufficient to maintain biologic width. In this case, the most stable prognosis can be anticipated. Second, there is a keratinized mucosa, but it is not attached. This is keratinized mucosa without biologic width. As shown, there is sufficient keratinized mucosa. However, if you look at the X-ray image, abutment height is very tight. In this case, there is keratinized tissue, but because there is lack of biologic width, our body tries to secure that biologic width with alveolar bone resorption. Although there is keratinized mucosa, if teeth brushing is insufficient, there is a high possibility of peri-implantitis or peri-implant disease. Third, it is non-keratinized tissue, but this is with biologic width, attached to non-keratinized mucosa. This patient came to my dental clinic in 2013. Always, it looks slightly reddish, almost as if there is inflammation. There is no keratinized tissue. It's all non-keratinized tissue. However, although 19 years have elapsed, you can see that the bone height is stably maintained. This is a typical case of attached non-keratinized mucosa. In this case, although there is no keratinized mucosa, the prognosis is very stable. The final case is the worst case. There is no attachment and there is no keratinized tissue. This is non-keratinized tissue with no biologic width. If you take a look, 
On X-ray, the implant is almost floating. All implants show severe alveolar bone resorption. This is peri-implantitis. You can see there is no keratinized mucosa at all. It's made of mucosa and abutment height is very short. At the time of implant placement, biologic width was not secured and there was no keratinized tissue. Because of that, alveolar bone resorbed very quickly and bad results came to be. Then, what is good peri-implant mucosa and bad peri-implant mucosa? The best peri-implant mucosa is attached to keratinized mucosa. There is biologic width and keratinized mucosa. That is the best. Second, it is non-keratinized mucosa, but it is attached and has biologic width. This is the second best case. Third, there is a keratinized tissue, but it is not attached. Biologic width is not secured, but there is a keratinized mucosa, and there is that much higher possibility of bad prognosis. Last but not least, this is a case where bad prognosis is bound to occur. This is non-attached, non-keratinized tissue. There is no biologic width, and our body naturally responds by resorbing the bone and tries to secure the biologic width. There is very high possibility of peri-implantitis occurring in this case. Last but not least, finally, how to secure peri-implant tissue? There are two conditions. I would like to end off on this note. First, you need to place implants sufficiently deep. You should not place it excessively deep. The most important is to use a one guide or guided surgery to place the implant in ideal position. You can place it with ideal biological width and form ideal peri-implant mucosa. In the same context, the more posterior you go, the vestibular depth becomes shallower. You need to have a, a deeper vestibular depth to have a better peri-implant mucosa. Based on what we've discussed, I hope you'll be able to understand more on peri-implant environment. For more specific details, please refer to offline master course. Thank you for watching.